Amedeo Opechi was born in 1876 in a small village near Venice, Italy. His widowed mother read him letters from his uncle in America, and Ameo told everybody that he was going to go to America one day. Everyone knew that he was an exceptionally bright and enterprising child, and by the time he was 11 years old, his family had helped him save enough money for an immigrant's ticket to America, and he set sail by himself. One story says that Amadeo had no money for food, so his mother gave him a bag of peanuts, which was all he had to eat for the 10-day crossing. But in this land of opportunity, Amadeo, at 11 years of age, went to work as a bellhop, and he also helped uh, with a fruit stand, as a helper in a fruit stand, worked hard, saved his money, as he promised his mother. He soon learned that Americans like peanuts, and he shared them with them, but few, if any, grew peanuts. So he found a place to plant a few peanuts that he had left. While his peanuts was growing, he saved enough money to buy a horse and a wagon. When his peanut crop came in, he drove around calling himself a peanut specialist, selling roasted peanuts. And by 1906, he had developed his own method of blanching and roasting peanuts, and he founded planters. Peanuts. He became wealthy enough to sell, send money to his family in Italy. Years later, he gave to the city of Sussex, of Suffolk, uh, Virginia, the Louise Obici Hospital, named after his wife. He had a handful of peanuts, and he had a choice with what to do with them. He could have eaten them all, or he sold them. He wisely chose to save a few and plant them. I don't know if Amegio knew about the law of the harvest that we're going to read about in the scriptures, but he certainly practiced it. We are in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and I'm reading verses 6 through 15. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, and whoever sows generously will reap generously. Each of you should give what you, should, what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As is it written, they, have, they that have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies thee to the sower and bread for, uh, bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. The service that you perform is not only supplying the needs of the Lord's people, but is also overflowing in many expressions of thanks to God. Because of the service by which you have proved yourself, others will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. And in their prayers for you, their hearts will go out to you because of, their, of the uh, surpassing grace God has given you. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift. Pray with me. With this much snow on the ground, Father, it's hard to think of sowing seed. But we thank you that even in a few weeks' time, as the snow melts, we will ready the land once again for harvest. And in a spiritual sense, Father, we don't need to wait for the snow to melt. We can do it now. So help us to hear about the laws of the harvest and to put them into practice we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. 
I'm having a few throat problems today, uh, thus the bottle. Uh, peanuts are grown in Indonesia. Do you know, uh, have you ever seen peanuts grown? They're grown in Indonesia. They like to be drained well. And uh, they, they grow underground. The peanuts uh, grow underground with a lovely little green plant on the top. Um, because of the drainage and whatnot, they, a lot of peanuts were, were planted in Indonesia uh, when we were there. And uh, uh, one winter, uh, one spring, well, it's, it's tropical, one season, uh, uh, a rich farmer, uh, a wealthy farmer, uh, who very much loved our two little girls, which is, there they are, which uh, loved our two little girls. Uh, this is quite a few years ago. Uh, but he invited us to go and help him harvest his peanuts. The uh, peanuts were uh, planted on a very, very steep hill. And uh, so the, these girls were about this age. These girls uh, would tug as hard as they could bending down, of course, tugging as hard as they could to get the peanut up. And then when the peanut broke, when it came through, they would lose their balance, tumble backwards, and literally roll down a long, long hill, screaming and laughing at the top of their lungs. Uh, this farmer probably lost money on these two little girls and his peanut crop, but it was wonderful to bring in the harvest of peanuts that year. Well, in this passage, we are given the principle and we are given the practice and we are given the produce of the harvest. So verse 6 has the principle. Remember this. Whoever sows sparingly will reap sparingly, but whoever sows generously will also reap generously. This uh, verse can be summarized in eight words. Plant little, harvest little. Plant much, harvest much. Unless some other circumstances take their toll, this principle works, always works in life. If you invest a little, you can expect a small amount in return. Now, of course, every get-rich scheme you've ever heard promises you the opposite. They promise you that if you give a little, you're going to get a lot back. But the law of the harvest says, friends, you reap what you sow. The principle works in how we use our time, in how we use our spiritual gifts, in how we witness, in our volunteer work. You reap what you sow. I want to give you three axioms that accompany this principle. The first axiom is you always reap what you sow. If I want high grade peanuts, I must plant high grade peanut seed. If I want God's blessing, then I need to give him the best. Jesus told us in Luke 6, 38, Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will pour out into your lap. For with the measure you use will be the measure to you. If you give, you will receive. Your gift will be returned to you in full measure, pressed down, packed together, overflowing. Whatever measure you use in giving, that measure will be, back, will be given back to you. Then he says, seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these other things will be added to you. Second axiom is this, that you reap more than you sow. One plant, uh, one peanut plant, produces a bush with many peanut plants. One potato seed produces many potatoes. One corn seed produces a stock of corn with two or three ears on it, hopefully. One life lived for God can influence hundreds or thousands of other lives. And the third axiom is this. You always reap 
later than you sow. Sowing and reaping don't happen at the same time. They don't happen on the same day. It may take months or years to see your harvest. And you may never see the results of your harvest until you get to heaven. Much of my life has been tied up in overseas work, and I have no idea where many of those people are today. I did so. I will not see the result of that harvest until I get to heaven. If you say, well, I really tried tithing, but I really went behind in the process, so I'm not going to do it anymore, you are getting ahead of yourself. You can say, well, I tried witnessing, but no one came to Jesus. You always reap later than you sow. Sowing calls for patience, and it calls for faith in the principle of the harvest. In Malachi, God invites us to test him by returning all the tithes to a storehouse, which is his church, and to see if he doesn't open the windows of heaven to give more blessing than we can handle. Understand that all of our blessing will not be in the form of material things, and God doesn't always give a timetable on when we will receive those blessings. He will do it in his time and when it's best for us. Here's the point. If, if, if God, would not, uh, God would not issue that challenge if he didn't want you to try and accept that challenge, and if he didn't intend to bless you in more ways than you can imagine. Farmers many times stagger their crops. Our daughter at one point lived in uh, Wheatley, Ontario. And Wheatley, Ontario is just a short distance away from Leamington, Ontario, which was the center of the Heinz Company. It was, it's actually true on any August when you can walk down the streets of Leamington and find tomatoes on the street because these huge, huge uh, uh, truckloads of tomatoes go down Main Street in order to get to the plant. And when they turn the corner, there are tomatoes who roll, that roll off. It was the most amazing thing to visit her because when you sign a contract with Heinz, you signed a contract on when you would begin to plant your seed. And for thousands and thousands of acres around that area, there was a timetable. And some farmers planted early and then some planted later so that Heinz didn't have all the tomatoes at once. They staggered that crop all the way through the summer. We keep on trusting and investing all that we have. We stagger our planting and our harvest. Remember that most of our dividends that we get in our harvest we will be, are being laid up for us in heaven with compound interest. Then there's the practice in verse 7. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. This tells us about the principle of the harvest. How does a farmer decide what kind of harvest he wants? Well, they first decide the harvest they want to reap, and then they plant accordingly. They don't plant haphazardly. They have a plan. The plan begins not with the amount of seed they buy, but before that, they decide what size of crop they want to produce. If they need a large amount of oats to feed livestock, they'll plant a large amount of seed. So let me give you some practical suggestions of giving of your time and of your talents and of your money. Give generously. You reap what you sow. Give cheerfully. Farmers, when they buy the seed to plant, don't begrudge the money they paid. When they buy the seed, they do it happily because they know that it's going to bring dividends to them. They do it cheerfully because they anticipate a bountiful harvest. That's why verse 7 says God loves, 
well, you know, it says, God loves a cheerful giver. The, the word actually means hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver. You know, when we took the collection up this morning, we should have done much more laughing <laughs> than we did. But we should be absolutely overjoyed that God wants us to give and that we are able to give. Hilariously happy. Thank him for the ability to give because you know that God is going to repay you many times over what you've already given. Give prayerfully. Ask God how much his work needs and what your responsibility will be. Give prayerfully. Give logically. Determine what your gifts are and how this congregation or this community can use those gifts and then give accordingly. And then there is the produce. Verses 8 to 15. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that, you, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work as it is written. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies the seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you will be in generous on every occasion and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. In, in verse 6, we see the principle of investing abundantly. In verse 7, we see the practice of giving cheerfully. And here, we consider the result of the produce. What kind of crop may we expect if we plant our handful of peanuts in God's field? Well, look at, look at the superlative words of this verse. All grace abound. All times. All things, rather. At all times. All you need for every good work. God is repeating himself to express upon us, to impress upon us that we can't outgive him. He doesn't need our gifts. He owns everything. We need to learn to turn loose our material possessions and our talent and our time and learn to obey God, and then we will learn how he can be trusted to bless us superabundantly. Look at the benefits this passage promises. The benefits to you and me will be increased seed and harvest, righteousness made rich in every way, a generous spirit. That's to us. Look to the benefit of others from our faithful giving. They will be blessed by our generosity. They will praise God and they will pray for us. That's what the passage says. And when we give, God's work grows, and missionaries and ministries are supported all over the world, and Jesus gets the credit. It's a win-win situation. When God's people support God's work the way that God's Spirit leads them to. I challenge you to give this year, at least, as Malachi suggested, uh, 10% of your income to your local church. That's the storehouse. There is nothing God won't bless if you give it to him first. He will bless our finances. He will bless our fitness. He will bless our family. He will bless our future. The produce you reap will be directly received in proportion to how much you plant. Under grace, when we were saved, we gave ourselves and all that we possessed to God. And when we say to Jesus, who is our Lord, it means that we should consult him about everything. When we're thinking about giving to his church, we ought to ask how much he wants us to give. Personally, 
I don't believe that God would leave Christians to give less under grace than what he asked the Jews to give under law. I believe that the tithe is the minimal every child of God should give. Personally, I, we give our tithe to our home church, and then it gives us freedom to also give our offerings to places like Canadian Baptist Ministries, Crandall University, Acadia University. We can't give to every cause, but we, try, we can try to give regularly to two or three ministries besides the church that we attend. This is Communion Sunday. And in a few moments, we are going to take a piece of bread, and later we are going to hold a cup. And this morning, as you take the bread, and as you take the cup, I want you to think of what you have. Your finances, your gifting, your time, your opportunities. Think of those things and ask God to help you to give them appropriately back to him. To give generously. To give prayerfully. To give cheerfully. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, they have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Pray with me. At the core of our being, Father, is selfishness. We somehow think that we own things. And we would ask that you would deal with that selfishness. That we might become hilarious givers realizing that you own everything and everything we have from the breath we breathe and the freedom that we enjoy and the money we have in our pockets and the family situation that we are with, that these things are yours. So you gave them to us. And then may we, with grateful hearts, be more than happy give back to you. We ask it in Jesus' name.